Peace. And we really appreciate what Brother James Rafferty was just sharing about the remnant. And I know you were encouraged as I was. You're in for a treat in our next presentation. I want to welcome all of those who are here with us at the Granite Bay Hilltop Adventist Church. And I want to welcome all our friends who are watching. We know we have a big audience listening now on television, on 3ABN, AFTV, the Good News Network in Phoenix, I just saw, is carrying the program. And we want to greet all of you as well. You know, uh, our next speaker and I have a unique relationship. Uh, Brother Clifford Goldstein will be presenting in just a moment. I'll tell you a quick story. He said, I have time to do that, so I'm not stealing his time. So I was in Canada during the general conference session. I was just sort of walking around trying to find a place to eat some food, and I ran into Cliff, who I knew, because Cliff has been the senior editor for the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lesson for over 20 years now. And so we knew each other professionally, but not well. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm looking for a place to eat. And I said, oh, let's go. So we're eating together, and just in the process of conversation, we have the typical question, so where did you grow up? Miami Beach. Oh, I grew up in Miami Beach. Where'd you go to school? I went to Nautilus. I said, I went to Nautilus. How old are you? I won't tell you what he said, but he's my age. <laughs> and it turns out that here we had two secular Jews that were atheists going to the same public school in Miami Beach, and we're looking at each other. He's editing the Sabbath school lesson for the World Church, and I'm teaching it. Isn't that the Lord's son? Now we're just backstage talking. I said, well, I just read online that you were born in New York. He said, yeah. I said, I grew up in New York City. <laughs> so we continue to be amazed. Cliff is a, a real joy. Because of his background and coming from uh, just the secular world and the intelligence, he thinks outside the box. So it's a real treat, and you're going to have to stay on your toes to keep up with him. But I'd like to invite Cliff to come out. He is a, an author, a presenter. And we're going to have prayer. Cliff, you hiding back there? Come on out. Cliff, he's full of surprises. <laughs> we're going to have prayer and ask God to bless him in his presentation on 1844, Made Simple. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness and your blessings. Uh, you've promised, Lord, that when we come before you to study the word, that uh, the Holy Spirit will take possession of our minds and hearts. As Christ and the truth are exalted, we pray that uh, people will come closer to you and embrace the truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. And be with Cliff. Thank you. I recognize him from Nautilus Junior High. He wore his hair differently back then. <laughs> I became an Adventist. Well, just I grew up very, like Doug, a secular Jew. And, and then it just hit me one day that truth had to exist. I mean, there's something here. There's a reality here. Something had to explain it. And whatever that was, that was the truth. And even though I knew it had to exist, I had no idea how I could find it. If I could find it, anyone could. But I thought, if I could know it, I wanted to know it no matter what. And a couple years later, I ended up becoming a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I met the Adventists in the fall of 1979. That's when I was converted. That's when I was born again. And I met these Adventists in a health food store, and I didn't even know they were Adventists at first. And they started studying with me, and it took me, from the time I met them, it took me about eight months to finally join the church. I mean, the Adventists... You folks born and raised in the church, you have no idea how strange it could appear to those of us. You know, the food. I used to say to these people, do you eat anything real? I mean, it was just the food and, and having non-Jews keep the Sabbath. It was, it was a, quite an adjustment for me. But anyway, I do join the church in 1980. 
Now, for those of you who were around or old enough and in the church in 1980, you will know that it was really a very, very tumultuous time. The church got hit with, with, with they call, what was this guy? That, he was kind of the avenous Bernie Madoff. Oh, Davenport, yeah. He's kind of the avenous Bernie Madoff. Got hit with that. There was Walter Ray came out attacking Ellen White. And then more, and to the point, there had been an Adventist, well-known and long, well-beloved Adventist theologian named Desmond Ford, who came out with a very stringent attack on the sanctuary message. So I get hit with all this stuff right away. I mean, I was somebody, I knew so little when I once asked somebody, and I'm Jewish, and I asked this guy, I said, was King David Jewish? Okay, and he looked at me. I'm in Israel with this Jewish guy, and he says, is King David Jewish? He, he was astonished. Now, I say that only for you to understand I knew nothing. And then I get thrown into this maelstrom in the Adventist church in 1980. And it took me a while, it took me a while to, till I finally started, because, you know, they kept on talking about spirit of prophecy, spirit of prophecy. And, and then I realized what they were talking about, and it took me a while till I started to accept Ellen White's prophetic gift. And I could honestly say I haven't had a doubt about the validity of Ellen White's prophetic gift in 40-some years. What is her role? How should she be used? What is her authority? We'll be fighting with that probably through the millennium. But until then, I, I have accepted her and then I realized, early on though, as I'm getting hit with this stuff, I said, I have to make sure, because the fourth thing threw me a bit, I have to make sure I know what I need to know to be a Seventh-day Adventist from my Bible and my Bible alone. I had to be grounded on that. Anyway, I'm in the church, and I'm getting hit with the Ford stuff that's raging, and I realize that I know all our doctrines from the Bible alone. The Sabbath? I don't need Ellen White for the Sabbath. Are you kidding me? Salvation by faith alone in Jesus? You don't need spirit of prophecy for that. The, the, the state of the dead? The second coming? Even the mark of the beast? All of that. I didn't need Ellen White for any of that. And the, and the longer I'm an Adventist, the more firmly grounded I've gotten in these things from my Bible and my Bible alone. But then it hits me, it hits me that the only thing I didn't understand from the Bible alone, the very thing that was coming under sustained attack was the 2300-day, 2300-year prophecy of Daniel 8.14. I thought, well, isn't that sweet? You know, because it was, we were being attacked from within on that by all sorts of people, throwing up all sorts of arguments, and I was green. I, I, didn't, I knew nothing. And I have to admit, I was thrown. When, that, when I got hit with that. Now, I, I like to tell people, I don't really consider myself a particularly deep thinker, but I'm a logical thinker. I think logically. I think I got it from my dad, who was a mathematician. And I think logically, and it hit me, that if 1844 is wrong, if this isn't true, then our church was founded on a lie. It's as simple as that. It was, and I'm going to touch on this a little more tomorrow. So I realized if our church arose from 
the, the aftermath, the wreckage you want of the Millerite movement based on our reinterpretation of the 2300 days. And I realized, I said, I'm sorry, if that is wrong, then the entire justification, the entire prophetic foundation of our church was wrong. And, I, and so I said, either I get it from the Bible, and the Bible alone, or I'm out of here. I hadn't been in the church that long. I, that vegetarian stuff still wasn't sitting well with me. You know? So I, I would have left, okay? Well, voila. I mean, the fact that I'm standing here now more than four, I can't believe next year I'm going on 40 years at the GC. You know, it's grace. They've tolerated me there for 40 years. Anyway, the fact that I'm here testified to what happened. And I ended up out of this. I ended up from my early, I mean, I dove into this stuff. I got into it, and the result of my labors, you know, it's funny, I've written 26 books. Most of them flopped. Most of them are out of print, so 26 out of print flops. But the one book, I wrote this book based on that experience called 1844 Made Simple. And that's the one book of mine that's still in print. They'll be printing that long if time should last, long after I'm in the carbon cycle. And anyway, I did... That was the foundation of it. And 1844 Made Simple, and it really was simple. And then what happened was... I'm in the church, and I write this, I'm getting grounded in this, and then I used to, for a number of years, I'd go to camp meetings, this is in the 80s, and I do this 1844 Made Simple seminar. Did it at camp, I did it for years, and then frankly, I just got bored. I just didn't feel like doing it anymore, and so I stopped. But it took, usually took me three and a half hours to do it. Okay, and now we're going to do it this, this evening in, I don't know, whatever the clock is, the time. I don't see a clock here. Well, whatever. They'll pull me out when they need to. Anyway, yeah, would not nice. Oh, oh, there we are. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. So the bottom line is I want to whip through the basics here. Now, I'm going to start out with a point, and I'm going to hammer this point to probably where you you said, all right, we get it, we get it, but maybe one day you might be thankful for me hammering it. The key, the foundation to our whole prophetic message, the rock upon which the whole thing stands, and if you keep grounded in this, I don't know how you can be duped by the sheer nonsense that some among us are promoting. And the key to the whole thing is very simple. It's Daniel 2. If you get grounded in Daniel 2, this is the foundation. Okay, now Daniel 2 we know with its four earthly kingdoms. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and God's final kingdom. Okay. Okay, really, that's Daniel 2. Well, probably all of us know this. It's foundational. It lays the groundwork for everything that follows. Okay, and the key, and, and really there's a key point in here that I'm going to hammer over and over again, and you're just going to go, Bleh, all right, we get the point. But you got Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and then after Greece, Remember the iron in the legs. After Greece comes one metal iron, and the iron goes all the way through. The iron's mixed with clay, but it's still iron all the way through until God establishes his eternal kingdom. So the point is, after Greece, one power alone arises. And that power remains until the end of the world when God establishes his eternal kingdom, okay? And again, we're dealing here, so what, what's the one power that arises after Greece? 
and goes all the way through until the end. It's Rome. It's solely, solely, totally, only Rome. And you could be as dogmatic about that as you need to be. Now, with that in mind, if you've got your Bible, open to Daniel 2.35. Because it's talking about the stone cut out without hands that destroys the image. Okay, and oh yeah, wait, I gotta, I'm not used to the clicker. Okay, it's destroy, it's talking about the stone cut out without hand, 34, and then and it, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed and became as chaff from the summer, summer threshing hall, and the wind carried them away. No trace was found. And the Aramaic there is kal atar la hishtakalahon. All trace of them was not found. Okay, no trace was found. Now, the reason I bring that up, so it's chaff, it's destroyed, nothing is there. Now, the reason I bring this up is because you will occasionally hear, and I hear it from some Ford minions, and it's, well, the stone cut out without hands, that's really Jesus on the cross. Okay, and you know, who, you know, Jesus defeated the principalities and powers and so on. And, you know, it sounds so nice, a cross-centered, Christ-centered Jesus on the cross. But I'm sorry, I mean, am I hallucinating? But are there not nations still here? Are there not these powers? And it says, call atar lo, he's the God of the home. No trace was found. Now, the reason that they do this, whether consciously or unconsciously, if that's Jesus on the cross, then suddenly Daniel 2 doesn't come to the end of the world. Daniel 2 then stops, you know, back, way back 2,000 years ago, and this foundational thing is kicked out from underneath us because that's the ultimate goal. Maybe the people doing it consciously aren't thinking it, but that's the fruit of it. But anyway, it doesn't work. Okay, so we come to Daniel 7 next. Now, Daniel 7, it's the same sequence of kingdoms, though it brings in more details, but it's still following the exact sequence of Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is the foundation. Boom, boom, boom. One kingdom after Greece all the way to the end of the world. So we get Daniel 7 here, one power rising after another. And again, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, papal Rome, God's kingdom. Daniel 7 follows Daniel 2. Okay? Now, in Daniel 7, the fourth kingdom, the fourth kingdom is this fourth beast, and out of it arises this little horn power. And you get all these details about this little horn power. It's going to think to change times. It's going to persecute you. On and on and on. But the little horn is still part of the fourth power. It's still part of the power that comes up after Greece and extends to the end of the world. I can't overemphasize that. Okay? So it repeats, it repeats the, what we had in Daniel 2, only it gives you a little more detail. And then you've got this, all this detail about, in fact, I don't have it on my notes here, but Daniel 7, Daniel asks about the vision, and he says four kingdoms are going to arrive, and then he puts the emphasis on the fourth kingdom, and then the end of the world comes. So Daniel 7, okay, we don't have to, it might be hard to, I'm not going to read all this, but I want you to just look, look at what's in the red if you can. It talks about, for Daniel 7, 8 through 10, 13. A little horn power. First, you've got the little horn power. Then you see in the red there, the judgment was set and the books were open. And then it says in the end, I saw night visions and behold, the son of man. And it, it ends in a, a kingdom which dominion which shall not pass away and not be destroyed. The point is here, you've got 
the sequence. You have the little horn, which is part of it's the fourth beast. You've got a judgment in heaven, and then you've got God establishing his eternal kingdom. Little horn, judgment in heaven, eternal kingdom. Let's go now to uh, here, 721. I saw in the same horn comes up after Greece, made war with the saints, and then until judgment, ancient of day, and judgment, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the saints possessed the kingdom. Again, you got Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, the phase of Rome. You got a judgment in heaven. God establishes his kingdom. In fact, this sequence is so important that it occurs again. Okay, then you got the fourth beast comes up. You got the fourth beast will be upon the earth, Daniel 7. Then you look down, but the judgment shall sit, and the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions obey and serve him. So look what you've got here. You've got it three times. You've got this sequence. You've got the fourth kingdom, pagan Rome, comes right after Greece, morphs into papal Rome, which is the little horn, followed by this massive heavenly judgment. Just read it. It's this massive judgment in heaven that's going on. And then that judgment leads to the, God's eternal kingdom. So here, voila. It's what you got there. Little horn, judgment in heaven, God's kingdom established after the second coming. Okay? You've got it. It, it. This stuff is founded. It's on the basis, the foundation of world history. Talk about something immovable, something broad, something everybody. Can, it's boom, boom, boom. It's as firm as the history of the world. Okay. Rome, then judgment. And here's the thing, too. Oh, yeah, here's the thing, too. Even if you want to, <coughs> excuse me, even if you want to reject what we believe, how can you read Daniel 7 and not see a pre advent judgment? Three times you've got the little, then you've got this judgment that occurs in heaven. And then you got the establishment of God's kingdom. You know, a judgment that precedes the second coming. You mean like a pre-advent judgment, maybe? The exact thing that we're told is not true. Okay. So anyway, so again, Daniel 7, like Daniel 2. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece. One power coming up after Greece you got all these details extending to the end of the world. So here's Daniel 7. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Pre-advent judgment. It's there over and over in Daniel 7. Pre-advent judgment. God's eternal kingdom. Okay? So if you parallel Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. Babylon, Babylon, you par Medo, Greece, Rome, pre-advent judgment. God's eternal kingdom. Now, I put in 538 to 1798 there. I deal with that much more extensively when I did the long seminar. But look, you've got, with the little horn, you've got your first apocalyptic time prophecy. You've got your first apocalyptic... See, look, Dan, people say, well, it's literal. Well, look, Daniel 7, you've got lions with wings. You've got horns that are talking. It's not a literal, it's symbolic. So you're given a time prophecy. So obviously the time prophecy's got to be symbolic as well. And there, there's so much evidence for that. And 538 to 1798, look, even in the end, if you know that that little horn is Rome, you figure it's depicted here for a 1260-year period. You could look at that, and you could, even without these specific dates, it still brings you much further down in history, but that's what we use. Okay, so here, that's it so far, right this point right now. Look, you've practically got all you need right here for a pre advent judgment before the second coming of Jesus. You've got it all right here. Okay, now we go to Daniel 8. 
Now, Daniel 8, you're going to, well, if you study it, as I said, we don't, I can't get into all the details here. It's, I said this is three and a half hours. And uh, we have a sequence, one beast after another, but it ends with the sanctuary being cleansed. And we're going to look at that. Now, it's very interesting for whatever it's worth, and I think it's worth a lot. The vision in Daniel 8 has got animals, like the vision in Daniel 7. But, you know, not only are they clean animals, they're sanctuary animals. And they're even the animals that are used on the Day of Atonement. Something to think about, anyway. Now, before we get started on Daniel 8, <coughs> I, want to re- I want you to look at two texts with me. Or I'm just going to read them. And, and, and Daniel 8.17 and that the vision refers to the time of the end. So Daniel 8 says the vision is for the time of the end. It's important enough that it's later repeated, for the appointed time shall the end be. So two times in Daniel 8, we're told that it's for the appointed time of the end. Now, in Daniel 2, which forms the background, the end was the end of the world, okay? The end of the world. So in Daniel 2, the end is even future to us. Daniel 7, the end, it ends with God establishing his eternal kingdom. So the time of the end is there. So in Daniel 2... The end is the end of the world. In Daniel 7, the end, the end is the world. And so in the parallel prophecy, as we shall see in Daniel 8, it's also the end of the world. This is an important point because it comes under heavy attack. Okay, well, let's look now at Daniel 8. There's four elements. Daniel 8's really pretty simple. You got a ram, you got a goat, you got a little horn, and the sanctuary's cleansed. That's it. That's the whole thing. Ram, goat, little horn, sanctuary. Done, finished. And then the rest of it is just explaining it. Okay, so in Daniel 8, it says Babylon is not mentioned in there. And I think there's a reason Babylon doesn't come in. It was fading off the scene. But Daniel 8, the first two kingdoms are named for us. Read it. Daniel 8.20 says the ram is Media Persia. Hey, we already met Media Persia in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. So in case there's any questions, Daniel 8 names it for us, okay? And the he-goat is Greece. It names it for us. Now remember, in Daniel 2, you are the head of gold to Nebuchadnezzar. So Babylon is named for us. Meda Persia is named for us. Greece is named for us. Okay. And then, okay, so then three out of the four kingdoms have been named. So remember we had in Daniel 2, Babylon, Meda Persia, Greece, Rome, end of the world. Daniel 7, the same sequence. And again, we have here in Daniel 8 now, a power that rises after Greece and exist to the end of the world. We'll see in a minute. What power? Rome, only Rome, and Rome is named. All The whole New Testament unfolds in a Roman background. The whole thing is there. So practically, the New Testament practically names, all but names Rome for us. So in Daniel 8, we have Medo-Persia, Greece, and then one final power. Remember, it says the vision is for the end. For the end, and it's also super, the little horn comes, it's brought to an end that it'll be destroyed without hand. Now what does that make you think of? The stone cut out without hand and the foundation prophecy of Daniel 2. Supernaturally destroyed, the vision is for the end. So what power is this last kingdom in Daniel 8 that comes up after Greece, is greater than the two before it, is a persecuting power, and is a power that is supernaturally destroyed in the end. As in Daniel 2, it's solely, totally, only Rome. 
in all three chapters, one power alone comes up after ancient Greece and extends to the end of the world. And I've told it to you a number, I know, over and over. But here's the whole reason why I'm telling you this, why you have to be grounded in this. And that's really the whole purpose of me making this emphasis. Pretty much, if you pick up any Bible commentary, any Bible commentary written in the past 120 years, every single one of them, without exception, over and over will say this little horn power is King Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, it's every commentary, every single one without exception, okay? Jewish, Catholic, Protestant, everyone. Oh, you know, when, when the Greek Empire, we all know the story, Empire Alexander died and the different generals, the Ptolemies took over Egypt with Cleopatra and all that, and the Seleucid like came over the Middle East and Antiochus persecuted the Jews, wreaked some havoc, damaged the temple, on and on. And almost every commentary in the world, they're adamant. It's Antiochus, Antiochus, Antiochus. Okay, but again, Antiochus was defeated. The Jews find the Maccabeans. They threw him out, I think, one, like in the middle of the second century B.C. So if that's Antiochus Epiphanes, then boom. See, here's the thing, too. It's one thing you got these others out there who, you know, they built, a lot of this is built on the premise that Daniel was written in the second century B.C. and that, you know, the date of it is wrong and so on and, they, you know, they get rid of the prophetic factor. But when the seventh day Adventist, and they're out there, when a seventh day Adventist tells you that the little horn has Antiochus Epiphanes. What are they telling you? What are they telling you? They're telling you that our church was built and founded upon a lie. Only, totally, only Rome. It's all it could be. And then it ends with the sanctuary being cleansed. Okay? So, what do we got here? Okay? Sanctuary cleanse. Now, if we parallel, if we parallel Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Daniel 8, this is what we get. Okay? You got Babylon, Babylon, Daniel 8. I, I don't know if it's X'd out. That shouldn't be there, but whatever. We know Babylon was there. My fault. I probably should have had that taken out. But then you got me to Persia, me to Persia, me to Persia. Greece, Greece, Greece. After Greece, one power to the end of the world. Rome, pagan and papal, Rome, Rome, pagan and papal. We got the dates. And then parallel, the pre-advent judgment parallels the sanctuary being cleansed. And then you got God's eternal kingdom, God's... And it says, Daniel 8 says, cut out without hands. So we don't want to... It points to Daniel 2. It points to the stone cut out without hands. And I think it's a clear reference to it. But either way, we've got this sequence. So in these parallel prophecies, the, judge, the pre-advent judgment of Daniel 7 leads directly to, parallels the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8. They're different expressions of the same event. Daniel 8 brims with Old Testament sanctuary imagery, showing that this cleansing of the sanctuary, it's all part of Christ's heavenly ministry. And again, that's all I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Okay? So again, oh, think, oh, oh, think about this. I thought about this one day, and it blew my mind. Me to Persia is a real big, important power in the history of the world, right? They were the ones that let the Jews come back. Okay. Medo-Persia. Med so this is a major event in the history of the world and the history of God's people. Greece, ancient Greece, 
major power in the history of the world and the history of God's people. So remember, there are just four elements. First element, Greece, major power. Meda, you know, Meda Persia, major power. Um, Greece, a major power in the history of the world. Rome, major power in the history of the world. And then the chapter climaxes. It, you got this major power, this major thing, this thing, and then it climaxes with the sanctuary being cleansed. So even if you wanted to reject what we believe, whatever this cleansing of the sanctuary is, it's obviously got just the parallel to everything it's with. It must be something major in the world, not Antiochus Epiphanes. And what it is, it's that judgment scene in Daniel 7 that leads to God establishing his eternal kingdom. Daniel said, this is what it leads to. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. I mean, that's pretty important stuff, okay? So you got all these worldly kingdoms and then that cleansing of it. You see my point? All this major stuff, whatever that cleansing of the sanctuary is, it's got to be something of major importance. Okay. And And as I said, as far as I know, well, I know I know, we are the only people in the world who are teaching this. And I think this could fit in with James Rafferty's talk. James, I hadn't seen the guy in 10 years. He doesn't look a day older than last time I saw him. I said, James, you dye your hair? He said, no. (laughs) How do you say that? Anyway, okay, now, we're close, but we're still not at 1844, okay? I mean, if you get, if you, I'm going to chance going back. If you come here, you clearly, if, if you stopped here, You'd clearly see the pre-advent you, and, and the sanctuary cleansed are the same thing. You've got this a major event occurring after the first prophetic time prophecy, first apocalyptic time prophecy. Then you've got some major event in heaven, the cleansing of the sanctuary before the second coming of Jesus. This here alone gets you 90% of the way there. Okay, now... If you go to Daniel 8, Daniel 2, you have a dream or a vision, and there's a full explanation. He's told, you know, the kingdoms, there are four kingdoms that are going to come up, and then stone's going to, you got a full explanation. Daniel 7, you got a dream or a vision. And you got a full explanation. He tells you these are different kingdoms that are going to arise, and then one more king, you know, and then there's going to be the fourth beast, and so on, and then there's this judgment, and then God sets up his eternal kingdom. Now, if you go to Daniel 8, there's a dream and a vision, but there's only a partial explanation. It's very clearly stated in Daniel 8 that there's part of the vision that Daniel does not understand. Okay, he says he doesn't understand. Daniel 2, everything was explained. Everything was explained. 7, Daniel 8. Three of, two of the three kingdoms are named for us. Okay, but there's one thing he says The only thing Daniel does not understand is the vision concerning the 2300 evenings and mornings. For Daniel 8, 14, he said unto me, unto 2300 days. Well, the literal Hebrew, you know, is Erev Boker, evening, morning. That's the literal Hebrew there. And later on, so again, later on in Daniel 8, again, the ram is explained the goat is explained. Daniel does not understand the vision of the evening and morning. And let's take a look. 
And the vision, now and I'm not going to get into it, there are two different words for vision in the Hebrew in Daniel 8. Da- Daniel 8 goes, reverts back to Hebrew from the Aramaic. And the vision of the evening, the mare, okay, of the evening and mornings was told is true. Okay, and he says, so the evening mornings, that's Daniel 8, 14, is true. And then he says, I was astonished at the mare. Notice that mare, you see in the, in the orange here. Aha mare, I was astonished on the vision. The ain may be, but I didn't understand. Again, the ram was named for him. The goat was named for him. The little horn he's told is this major power. The only thing he doesn't understand is the mare of the evening and the mornings. And I none understood it. Okay, I was astonished. Everything else was explained. Now, when you go to Daniel 9, When you, you got the clock TV live here. They don't cut you, and there's no grace. <laughs> Daniel prays this beautiful prayer. And it's really, it's worth, but nowhere in Daniel's prayer is Daniel asking for any understanding. Go back and read Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. I've read it over and over and over. Nowhere he's saying this happened because of this. This happened because of that. No, nowhere is he saying I need any explanation. Okay, he's praying. And then, and then what happens? While I was, Daniel 9, 21, while I was speaking, the man Gabriel appears. Gabriel. If you read Daniel 8 and Daniel 8, Gabriel was told to make Daniel understand the vision. So you've got the same angel who we saw in Daniel 8 who was told to make him understand, okay? Gabriel comes, and then he says to him, he says at the, okay, again, here's where the Hebrew would be helpful. Okay, at the beginning of your supplication, the commands come forth, and I have come forth to tell you, this is beautiful, ki hamadot atah for you are greatly beloved. I wrote a column about that one time. Telling you are an angel from heaven, for you are greatly beloved. Bein ba ma, understand this thing, v'chabein ba mare. Understand the mare. What mare? Well, the last mare we had was, was the vision of Daniel 8, 14, that he said he didn't understand. And what kind, of ma- what kind of vision was the mare of Daniel 8, 14? It was a time prophecy. So what's the first thing Gabriel says to Daniel? And he gives him, he says, 70 weeks are cut off or determined. A time prophecy. Okay, so let's just review. Let's just review this. Okay. We leave Daniel 8, and the only thing he doesn't understand is the mare, the vision of the 2300 days. Everything else is explained. In Daniel 9, the same angel interpreter comes to him who was there in Daniel 8 telling him to understand that Jesus, I'm sure it was Jesus, who else, told him to Make Daniel understand the, the prophecy, okay? And then angel, the same angel comes, and he tells him he's going to help him understand the mare. Well, the only mare was the 2,300 days. And the next thing Gabriel does is give him another time prophecy, a smaller one that the 20, than the 2,300 days, and tell him it's going to be cut off from. Cut off from what? Obviously the other one. You know, it's fascinating. I used to always eat at the GC. There was a Jewish deli, and I used to go there all the time and eat. All these Adventists would be there, and Jews, even Muslims. They'd see Muslims coming in because they knew they could get halal food there. And right next door, there was a Jewish bookstore. And I used to haunt, I used to hang out in that bookstore. And I bought, 
It's called the Art Scroll Series. It's just the Orthodox commentary on the Bible. And I bought their commentary on the book of Daniel. And I was really curious, what do these Orthodox Jews do with Daniel 9, 24 through 27? I wish I had the book. I could have shot a picture. The first thing these, oh, they come to the 70-week prophecy. And the first thing these Orthodox Jews do is link it back. And they use the word mare of Daniel 8, 14. They point right and says, this is the mare, Daniel 8, 14, that he did not understand. In other words, the Jews saw, really, these two are one prophecy. Anyway, I thought that was, that was exciting to see these others on it. Okay, now we come to... Okay, I got three and a half minutes left to do the 70 week prophecy, okay? But fortunately, I really, I didn't intend to get into it deep because really, there's so much on it, okay? But just a few little things I want you to understand about it, okay? First of all, look, the 70 week prophecy, you know, it could get kind of dense. It could get, you know, what do you do with Daniel 9, 24, 9, 27? And on the wing of abomination shall one make desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Do you know what he's talking about there? Okay, it can get kind of deep. But there's a way to keep it really simple. Okay, the bottom line of the prophecy, you got 70 weeks, you know, 70 weeks, and then you got the two weeks and 60, you know, and seven weeks, 69 weeks. So you got 69 of the 70 weeks taken care of, and then you've got one week, the final week, and then the week is divided in half. You see the point? That is, that's the gist of the 70 week prophecy. And really, for our purposes, for our purposes, all we really need is the 457 B.C. date. That's all we need. You know, I've, you know it's really interesting, too. Desmond Ford, and I, I don't kind of, he was doing everything he could to attack, to destroy this prophecy. And I remember he had written, he, when he left, he had, where he got the boot, he had written, he had this magazine out called Good News Unlimited, and I couldn't, he had this 5,000-word article. 5,000 word article on why 457 can't be the date. Five, and you know, and when he gets done, you know what date he says it is? 458. Okay? The, the, see, it all, it's a difference of six months whether you want to use a spring to spring or a fall to fall calendar. Okay? And while Staunch, a guy that spent the last years of his life attacking it, the most he could do was come with a six month difference. Okay, so you come to 457 is actually one of the stronger old dates in the Bible that you could find. And so look, if you just start out with the 70 week 457 BC, that's the starting date, then you come to 30, you know that, but then here, 457 BD cut off, you add 2300 and you come to 1844. Again, there's more, obviously there's more, but the key is the 457 BC date. And here's the other thing too. You really can't go too far off with that date or you'll go off the dates of Jesus. We know the dates of Jesus. Anyway, well, look, I've got, I've got more that I could deal with. And uh, anyway, and I'm going to pick up, see the question now is, okay, this is it. What does it mean? And we'll deal with that tomorrow. And Pastor Ross, are you think you're going to come out? Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Hiding in the wings. Okay. Okay. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Sure. sure. Okay. Well, we're looking forward to tomorrow, right? Yeah. To get the rest of our presentation on 1844 made simple. Again, we'd like to remind all of those who are joining us, this is just the opening sequence of our summit weekend. So we have a lot of really important information 
a number of inspiring sermons yet to come. I want to remind you that we're going to start tomorrow at 10 Pacific time. Pastor Doug will be speaking tomorrow morning at 10, followed at 11 by Elder Ted Wilson, President of the General Conference. And then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have a number of exciting presentations. So we hope you won't miss any of it. We look forward to seeing you then.